Hello, everybody. You can probably see that um, I'm out of doors and I thought it would be a good idea to be in an oak woodland outside while I was delivering this talk, but it's actually quite cold out here. I don't know if I'm gonna to have to come in in the middle of this, but that'll work because I won't have to unplug my computer. It'll be quick. Um, and one reason that I wanted to do this is that there are those beautiful oak leaves silhouetted against the moon. And I thought that it would be a nice idea for you to test yourselves before and after to see if you can look at those leaves and figure out what they are now. And if not, can you do that better by the end of my talk? So I'm not gonna tell you right now what species those, uh, that oak is, but uh, I do want to point out that the leaves have rounded lobes and fairly deep spaces between the lobes. Those are called sinuses. And what that means is that this is an oak in the uh, deciduous oak in the white oak section. But wait a minute, uh, something's wrong here. Uh, how can a deciduous oak have leaves on January 27th? Well, I've been busted and it just goes to show that you can't trust technology and I guess you can't trust me either. So I'm gonna take off all my layers now because I'm actually inside my yurt, which is nice and toasty. And while I'm taking off my layers, I want to show you these earrings that I'm wearing, which are made from real acorns. And this is another before and after. If you can figure out what these, maybe you know what they are now, but if you don't, Hopefully you'll be able to by the end of my talk. So now uh, on with the show and I'm going to have to bring up my slide presentation now. So that's going to take a second. Today, I am going to give you tips for identifying the tree oaks of Northern and Central California. And I'll also throw in some pretty cool oak lore. So with fires and population pressures and climate change, oaks need friends now more than ever. And recognition is always the first step in friendship, whether you're talking about humans or lizards or trees. So why are oaks so important? Well, there are a lot of reasons. They sequester tremendous amounts of carbon, they retain groundwater, they improve water quality. They release a lot of oxygen, they improve and enrich soil, they're beautiful. But the reason I'm going to emphasize today is their tremendous biological productivity. More species and greater numbers of individual organisms live in oak woodlands than in any other terrestrial ecosystem in California. That's partly because oaks produce enormous numbers of nutrient-rich seeds that we know as acorns each fall. And they're packaged in sealed containers that enable them to persist for months or even years. And they become food for animals from insects and rodents to birds and bears and humans. Here is evidence of non-human acorn consumption, holes made by exiting weevil larvae nibble marks made by deer mice. I found these in an actual deer mouse nest and these shells cracked open by acorn woodpeckers. And as for humans, this is uh, Corinne Pierce, an amazing pomo educator and basket weaver who lives near me in Redwood Valley. And she's teaching people how to process black oak acorn. She and her family, along with many other families in my area, both native and non-native process and eat acorn every year. Here is a native woman from an earlier time pounding acorn on a grinding rock. And the acorn consuming cultures of California were probably the last in the world to rely primarily on acorn as their staple food into the modern age. 
an average family consumed about a thousand pounds of acorn a year and often they had twice that much stored against adversity. And the tradition continues today, though on a reduced scale. Here are some examples of the acorn granaries of the Tuolumne and Yosemite Miwok peoples. So besides producing acorns, oaks are also important because more than any other plant in North America, their large canopies support enormous numbers of caterpillars. This funny looking caterpillar in the upper left is the larva of the California sister butterfly who lays her eggs only on oaks. Her favorite is the canyon live oak, which is the tree in this photo. In spring and summer, caterpillars devour the leaves of oak and most oaks and most of them get eaten in turn, becoming the foundation of multiple food webs. And I wonder if you knew that caterpillars turn into birds. Well, how does that work? Well, caterpillars are the equivalent of mother's milk and Gerber's baby, fruit, baby food for baby birds. The ideal and irreplaceable food needed for most baby songbirds to survive. Caterpillars are soft and squishy and they're full of fat and protein and carotenoids. And when they aren't available, many baby birds starve and they have to be close by the nest. So this robin was raised on caterpillars and now she's collecting them to feed her own babies. And where does she find caterpillars? Primarily on native plants. Most caterpillars haven't evolved resistance to the protective toxins in introduced plants and can't survive eating them. So most people don't know this, but without caterpillars, we wouldn't hear much bird song every spring or see many birds. So when I was writing my book, I didn't know much about individual oak species. I was primarily fascinated with the plants and animals and lichens and fungi that live among the oaks. But after the book came out in 2014, everybody assumed I was an expert on oaks, on oaks themselves. So. I, I've had to play catch up. I've learned about planting oaks and protecting volunteer oak seedlings from Lindsay Daly of the Oak Granary and Carrie Heisey and Pallotta Pepper looked over early versions of this oak identification guide that I created, which is, as Sue said, a two-sided laminated guide that shows classic acorns and leaves of eight oak species. And in the bottom row, it shows galls that occur only on particular species. In this case, uh, in, on, in the white oak section, which is on what we're seeing here. This side of my guide is the white oak side. And this is the other side. And this is the red and golden oak side. So if you have trouble identifying oaks, you are in excellent company. Everybody has trouble, even the experts. And that's largely because oaks sleep around with oaks of other species. In other words, they hybridize and that changes how they look. So they often look like a little of one and a little of the other. And sometimes you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, heck if I know. So I'm gonna show you some reliable clues that will help. A lot of people have a hard time remembering the characteristics that are helpful for identifying oaks. So I'm going to play with some memory aids today. And toward the end, you'll even get to recite with me some little oak identification poems that I've made up. Okay, so the oak genus Quercus first appears in the fossil record about 50 million years ago. And it becomes well established in California about 20 million years ago. In the beginning, oaks were pollinated by wind, but then for some unknown reason, they decided to try insects. And that apparently didn't work out too well. So they went back to wind. So when I give talks in person, I always say, so who knows when oaks flower? So I guess I'll just ask you, who knows when oaks flower? Do you know when oaks flower? They flower in early spring. And so that might be why they went back to wind because there aren't very many insects around in early spring. And maybe the timing of their blooming wasn't as flexible. So there are about 600 oak species in the world. 
this one is in England, and North America is the world center of oak diversity. Mexico, which is part of North America, has a whopping 160 species, which is really amazing for such a small country. And the US has 90, about 90. And China is right up there uh, with 100 species. And all but a few of the world's oaks are in the Northern Hemisphere. Of the 90 that we have uh, in the US, Canada has, California has a respectable 22 species, quite a few of which are endemic to California, which means native only to California. Almost all of the oaks we see in California have been planted by one bird species. Do you know who you're going to see in the next picture? This is the California scrub jay who has co-evolved with oaks. Scrub jays eat the seeds of oaks. They're actually called seed predators, but they also plant the following generations of oak seedlings. Each of these birds stores up to 5,000 acres in the ground every fall in ideal spots for germination. And even though they can find all 5,000 of those if they need to within 250 days anyway, they end up leaving about a third of them in the ground uneaten, often just because they don't need them. Sometimes the jays are in a hurry and they carry two acorns, acorns at a time. And right at this minute, scrub jays are replanting lands that burned in the fires this year. But jays rely on oaks for something besides acorns, caterpillars. Like robins, they feed mainly caterpillars to their babies who will then, and their babies will then grow up to be planters of oaks. So this is a beautiful symbiosis between a tree genus and a bird species. Now I know that some of you don't know an oak from a buckeye, from a maple, so it should help to know that oaks are the only trees in North America that produce acorns. You can recognize acorns because they're the only nuts we have that are tucked into these caps, which are also known as cups or cap cupules. And by the way, a lot of people don't know this. Immature acorns are green and mature acorns are tan or brown and sometimes they turn to this beautiful black brown or mahogany brown. I, collect, I collected all of these acorns last fall in Mendocino County and the ones on the left represent eight species of oaks in the genus Quercus and those are classified as true oaks. So um, try saying the word Quercus with me just to get it into your mouth muscle, mouth muscle memory, <laughs> mouth muscle memory. The acorns on the right are from tan oaks, which are in the genus Notholithocarpus. And here is a tan oak acorn close up. So I hope you brought acorns. I tried to get the word out uh, that it would be important to bring acorns. And uh, I hope you also have uh, some paper and a pencil or pen. So look at the acorns that you brought and see if you have one with a bristly cap. If so, write tan oak on a piece of paper and set your acorn on it. And I'll wait a minute while you do that. These are the only acorns with bristly caps and my mnemonic aid for them is that they are bristling with indignation at not being considered true oaks. It's just one of those DNA things. According to my friend, Dr. Sherry Smith Ferry, who is a member of the Dry Creek Band of Pomo Indians, these are almost always the preferred acorns of native Californians who have tan oaks growing near where they live. She told me that people like these because it's easier, they're easier to prepare and they taste better and they have lower amounts of oil than black oak acorns, which are the other favorite of most of the Pomo peoples around here anyway. I live in the, in the greater Ukiah Valley. So notice how hairy this nut is. 
they are usually like that unless the hairs have worn off with age. And tan oak leaves are also covered with fine hairs unless they've worn off. So tan oaks are extremely important for wildlife as well as for humans because their acorn crops are more, more reliable than those of the other oaks. And that might be because unlike oaks in the genus Quercus, tan oak flowers are pollinated by both wind and insects. So now please pick up another one of the acorns that you've brought with you and close your eyes. And if the cap isn't connected to the acorn, just hold the cap. And if you have more than one acorn, keep track of which acorn goes with which cap. So roll the cap around in your fingers, feeling its texture on the outside. Then see if it has any scales that you can get a fingernail under. And, and be careful, because I don't want you to get a scale too far up under your fingernail or feel for hard bumps or warts. And on some caps, the warts are very, very small, kind of like grains of sand, small grains of sand. Or notice if the cap is kind of soft and velvety. And what we're doing now is trying to figure out which evolutionary group of oaks your acorn came from. These evolutionary groups are officially called sections. And in California, we have three sections, red oaks, white oaks, and golden oaks. The scientific names are on my guides. And the reason we're focusing on acorns is that they are part of the reproductive apparatus of the tree and the reproductive parts are the slowest to change when species hybridize. And the caps are the most reliable identifiers of all. So here, well, I made leaves change all over the map while nuts and caps are taking a nap. So oaks share their pollen across species lines, but not with just any old oak. They can be fertilized, an oak can be fertilized only by the pollen of an oak that is in the same section. So I don't know if you've been keeping your eyes closed all this time, but if so, uh, open your eyes now. And if you haven't already, see if your cap looks like any of these caps. These caps have modified scales called tubercles or warts. And they are typical of acorns in the white oak section. So if your acorn cap looks like one of these, jot down the term white oak section on a piece of paper and set that acorn and cap on it. If the cup looks like one of these, it is in the red oak section. These caps have somewhat papery scales that overlap each other like roofing shingles. If you have one or more of these, write red oak section on a piece of paper and set your acorn and cap on it. So I've talked about the white oak section and the red oak section and let's review with some mnemonic aids. So a memory aid for white oaks is W is for whites and warts or whites have warts. So say that with me. Whites have warts. And if you ha add a feeling to it, that may help you remember it better. Emotion uh, often helps with memory. So try saying it with some feeling or you could even sing it. And as you're doing that, take a look at the warty caps. So whites have warts or whites have warts or Whites have warts. So uh, another way to identify uh, acorn, um, identify white oaks in the white oak group, particularly oaks in the white oak group, but also uh, some of the other oaks, is with galls. The, actually, what I'm trying to say is that galls can help you identify a section. 
So these galls, which are called oak apple galls, occur on oaks in the white oak section. So if you see these, you can be sure you're looking at a tree in the white oak section. And in the spring, they're green. And then as they age, they turn tan and sometimes brown and sometimes almost blackish. I have a really fun chapter in my book on galls. But for now, I'm just going to say that a gall is produced by a tree when it receives chemical orders from a wasp the size of a fruit fly, a tiny harmless wasp. And each wasp species lays eggs only on trees of one section. So that's why galls are helpful for identifying a section. And now I'm going to throw down the gauntlet. If a wasp with a brain no bigger than the brain of a fruit fly can tell what section an oak is in, so can you. There are many more species of galls that occur on oaks, and especially in the white oak section. They're incredibly colorful and varied, and many are smaller than the tip of your little finger. So you really have to look for them. You really have to know that they're there. So just know that if you see any of these galls, you can be sure that you are in the white oak section. And this is just a portion of them. You can see many more if you go to Joyce Gross's website, JoyceGrossPhotography.com. And now on to a mnemonic aid for the red oak section. R is for red oaks and the reds have roofing shingles. They can also be kind of rough, so that's another R word. So I've discussed the white oak and the red oak sections. Now let's see if you have an acorn that looks like one of these. These are all acorns of canyon live oak, which is the only tree-sized oak in the golden oak section in Northern California. And that's also known as the intermediate oak section. So I'm not going to give you tips for identifying the golden oak section because it's kind of tricky. I'm just going to help you identify canyon live oak. A lot of people aren't even aware of the existence of this tree. So I'll spend a little extra time on it. So check out these, ac these acorns or these cups. They're often, the cups are often wide with thick walls, like the ones in this photo. They often have a cork-like quality with a little bit of give and a soft velvety surface. And that's the surf, the, the velvety surface is a result of the fine gold down that covers them. Or they can be wide and woolly like this one. I've only seen one of these, and that was up in uh, the Sierra in Yosemite. But these, uh, these acorns mature in their second year. So if you're looking at one of this year's acorns, like these, the corkiness and the thickness might not be so obvious because they're too young. But if you remove the cap and look at the underside, you can see the developing thickness. Right here is looking thicker. This is a, a canyon live oak cap. And this is a, a cap from an acorn in the white oak section. And it's thinner. So if you have an acorn that looks like any of these that you've just seen, write canyon live oak on a piece of paper. But to tell you the truth, I usually first recognize a canyon live oak by its leaves, which are quite distinctive because they're pretty thick and leathery and usually almost completely flat. Sometimes they're a little bit curved and they narrow, they, they narrow sharply to, to the tip, like the two on the right but I've been faked out before. So the best thing is to look at the backs of the leaves for fine gold hairs, as the two leaves on the right have. I rarely see this much gold, but this is pretty common 
but you won't find it on all the leaves because it wears off with age. So look for younger leaves. So here is an image of leaves and acorns together. And these acorns are still green, but they're much bigger and wider and they're bigger and have wider and thicker cups than those other ones I, than the young acorns I just showed you because they're older. Those other ones I showed you, I photographed last September 22nd. Okay, now look at the edges or the margins of these leaves, which are also from Canyon Live Oak. Why do these have spine tips? That's what those are called while these do not? And I was hoping you would ask that question. The, so here's the answer is some really cool oak lore. Deer and elk and, and caterpillars and wood rats all love to eat oak leaves. So oaks have evolved coping strategies for that. When a certain percentage of the lower leaves of a tree Get, gets eaten by deer or elk or anything, well, deer or elk actually, oaks secrete a hormone that causes the leaves only on the lower browsable parts of the tree to grow spine tips. The same phenomenon happens with coast live oak, interior live oak, and sometimes even blue oak, which is in a different section. Well, there, that's three sections represented with that now. So, um, but the tree has a really different strategy for dealing with caterpillars when they eat its leaves. Instead of discouraging the caterpillar by secreting ever more toxic chemicals that the caterpillars can't survive eating, the tree actually encourages them. It has a second set of leaf buds lying in wait just in case they're needed right in here. And when the tree loses a certain percentage of its leaves to caterpillars, it secretes a hormone that causes that second set of leaves to unfurl. And if too many of those leaves get eaten, there's a third set of leaf buds lying in wait. So the tree seems to have evolved a strategy for handling caterpillars and leaf damage. So much so that oaks can get completely denuded by caterpillars and recover. So instead of worrying about leaf damage like this on the left, we should celebrate it. In fact, in these days of plummeting insect populations, we should be saying, and say this with me with some excitement, yippee, look at that leaf damage. This tree has caterpillars. That means we'll have butterflies and birdsong next spring. So what this means is we have to start gardening for caterpillar and that means planting native plants, as I said earlier. And because there are about 20 to 30 times more moths than butterflies, we have to actually have to garden for moths. And we should think about turning our cities and towns into caterpillar paradises. Okay, that was a, a uh, tangent. Let's go back to identifying oaks. So now I'm going to take us to the red oak side of my guide, where we find black oak, light, interior live oak, so uh, Black oak, I can't see this very well, uh, coast live oak and interior live oak. And then on, over here we have uh, golden oaks. And I'm just going to move, I'm not sure you are seeing the whole thing. Okay. Um, so we just graduated from identifying oaks by section, two section, and now we're moving to the species level. But if you come away from this talk with nothing but what you've learned so far, you have a really good start. My next goal is to give you tips about valley, blue, and Oregon oaks, 
But first, I'm going to give you just a couple of tips uh, for some of the red oaks. So black oak, which is confusingly a red oak, is the only California oak whose leaves have long, fine, and somewhat flexible bristle tips at the end of the lobe, ends of the lobes. So these bristle tips are a 100% reliable clue as to what oak species you're looking at. But you just have to make sure that you're looking at an oak and not a maple. And it's the acorn. Well, that's the one way to know for sure it's an oak is if you can find an acorn. So to help remember this, say with me, black oaks have bristle tips. And one more time, fast. Black oaks have bristle tips. The acorns of black oaks are large and their sides are often parallel like this instead of going out or tapering sharply. They taper just, they often taper um, just fairly abruptly at the tip. And what is really di diagnostic is their very deep cups and the overlapping scales of the cups, which of course is the case with all of the red oaks. And now I'm going to give you a couple of tips for identifying coast live oak, which is also in the red oak section. Mature coast live oaks often have beautiful, curvy, sinuous, sometimes twisty trunks and limbs. And if you've ever been in a coast live oak woodland, it can be really magical. You expect to see fairies. And here's a tip for the truly dedicated. Many of the leaves on coast live oaks have what we call hairy armpits on the underside, like this. Can you find them? Most people look down here, but that's not where they are. They're, here's one hairy armpit and here's another hairy armpit. Really inconspicuous bits of fuzz that occur where the lateral veins meet the mid vein. So now fold your arms and put both hands in your armpits. And while still hugging yourself, say with me, it's on the screen now, coast live oaks are just like me with hairy armpits hard to see. When you're looking for hairy armpits, you may have to turn over 10 or 20 leaves before you find one, but you only have to find one. Close focus binoculars are very helpful, though you can often see the fuzz with just your naked eye. And just remember that here they're very magnified. So if you live near Coast Live Oaks, it might be fun to go out and see if you can find some fuzz. Another clue to Coast Live Oak, and this isn't in my guide yet, is that there are always fewer than six pairs of lateral veins and the other, uh, the leaves of the other live red oaks have many, many more uh, parallel veins on a side. Now I'm going to turn the chart over to the white oak side. And here we have three deciduous white oaks, uh, Valley, Oregon, and Blue, and one evergreen white oak on the far right. And I'm going to start with valley oak, Quercus lobata. These trees do grow in hills, but they love floodplains, which are in valleys, and that's where their name valley oak comes from. They used to grow in riparian corridors that were as much as five miles wide on each bank of the great rivers that flow out of the Sierra Nevada into the Central Valley before those rivers got dammed and channelized. And in fact, it is said that you used to be able to walk 
the entire length of the Central Valley without ever leaving the shade of a valley oak. It makes me cry sometimes when I say that. But they also grow on hills and ridges, valley oaks do, and there they send sinker roots as far as 80 feet down to find standing water. So here is a valley oak acorn. The cup has large warts and the nut is seated pretty deeply in the cup. The nuts are very large. When mature, they're the longest acorns we have in California, sometimes three times longer than they are wide. And if you turn the acorn over, its shape is roughly that of a V. So V is for very long V-shaped valley oak acorn. Try saying that with me. Very long V-shaped valley oak acorn. And now for the leaf of the valley oak, which is where a lot of confusion lies. And that's because valley oak leaves and Oregon oak leaves look a lot alike to the untrained eye. So these, these are called lobes. I call them, I think of them as hills and these are called sinuses and I think of them as valleys. On classic valley oak leaves, the lobes are softly rounded. And at least some of the sinuses on some of the leaves are deep and wide, like these two here. And sometimes the sides of the sinuses are kind of perpendicular, pretty perpendicular to the mid vein, rather than diagonal. Like this is a diagonal but these are pretty perpendicular. So most leaves on a given valley oak won't have these deep wide perpendicular sinuses, but if you find even a few leaves that have them, you're probably looking at a valley oak. And the acorn, that long V-shaped acorn with the deep cup will probably settle the matter. And if the inner edge of the sinus is, and if the inner edge of the sinus right here is parallel to the mid vein, that's also quite diagnostic. This leaf here has the straightest parallel edge I've ever seen. So all three of these leaves came off the same tree at the same time last fall, even these small young leaves. And these leaves are another clue to valley oak because I'm pretty sure valley oak is the only California oak that keeps producing small leaves, small young leaves all summer, or new leaves all summer. Another helpful word where valley oak is concerned is lacy because with all of those deep wide sinuses, there's a lot of negative space, open space, like there is with lace. And I especially see that on clusters of young leaves. <clears throat> and if you're still scratching your head and can't tell if you're looking at a valley oak leaf or an Oregon, Oregon or, or a valley oak tree or an Oregon oak tree, look for these galls. So here, um, there are two galls that are in this valley oak column. And each of these galls occurs on no other oak but valley oak. Here they are magnified. And in real life, this, these will only be at most half an inch across and these will be at most half an inch tall. So you really have to look for them. And your last tip for valley oaks is that the trunk and branches of these trees often grow into a vase shape with age. So you can kind of see how these are spreading out like a vase. So now we have a poem for another Valley Oak mnemonic aid. And please read it with me. Majestic Valley Oaks, the tallest of their kind, 
super long nuts spring a V-shape to mine. Their round lobe leaves have the deepest of sinuses. Look in well-watered valleys for these royal highnesses. And I don't think I mentioned that valley oaks are the tallest oaks in North America. And here in Mendocino County, we have the tallest out in a round valley near Covalo. So now uh, I'm going to move to Oregon oak, which is also known as Oregon white oak or Gary oak. And around here, a lot of people just call it white oak, but you can see how confusing that can be because there's a whole white oak section. So a blue oak is a white oak and a valley oak is a white oak. So it's clearer if you say Oregon oak or Oregon white oak or Gary oak. The typical Oregon oak, oh, and here I just want to point out how white these trunks are, and that's uh, why they're called white oaks. The typical Oregon oak leaf has more diagonal sinuses like these, and they're also narrower. And it has, remember how the valley oak lobes were rounded, and these have what are called acute tips. So now with that very short introduction to Gary Oak leaves, I'm, or Oregon Oak leaves, I'm going to uh, show you a couple of photos and see if you can tell which is Gary Oak and which is Valley Oak. And now you can probably see why people get these confused because at first glance, they look very similar. So make your votes and Three, two, one, here are the answers. Oregon oak, Gary oak here with diagonal sinuses, kind of narrow. I think of these as fjords. And valley oak here with deep wide sinuses, which I think of as valleys and rounded lobe tips. And these have those acuter, pointier tips. And these are a couple of galls that are a bonus. I, I rarely see these galls on anything other than valley oak. So you can, even though they do occur on others, if you see a lot of them, you're probably looking at a valley oak. And I don't think the Oregon oak acorn can ever be confused with the valley oak acorn because it's in the shape, more shape like an O than a V. And if you happen to see a speckledy gall like this, smaller than a ping pong ball, but papery thin, and if you open it up, you'll see this kind of sunburst of fine hairs that all come out from uh, the larval chamber, which is in the center then you can be sure it's, a, it's an Oregon oak. These don't occur on anything but Oregon oaks. And so now we have a mnemonic for Oregon oak. O is for Oregon oak with its O-shaped acorn and O-shaped gall. And here is a poem for Oregon oak. And read this with me, please. Oregon oak, nut shaped like an O, its cup almost falling off like some plumber's pants, you know. Sinuses diagonal and lobes with tips acute, leaves shiny above and velvet below, make Gary Oak a butte. Okay, here finally we come to blue oaks, and this is a tree on the land, of, it's on the land where I live. Ye shall know blue oaks by their leaves, which are blue <laughs> and they are unlobed or slightly wavy edged like this, uh, barely lobed is what I'm calling it. And yeah, you shall also know them by their bluish cast and the, and the blue, uh, the blue deepens as summer goes on. So there's a, this, did you wonder what this is? This is a gall. Here it is closer up. 
I saw it last fall for the first time. It's called plate gall. And here are the mnemonic aids for blue oak. Bleu, <laughs> bleu is for blue. Bleu is for the bluish cast, barely lobed leaves, and B is for buttery soft matte surface. So a lot of people mistake blue oak for something else, blue oak leaves for something else. So what species of oak are these leaves from? They're unlobed, like blue oak, or no, they're totally unlobed. They're not even barely lobed. They have smooth edges. They're, we don't see any spine tips. But look at their color. So compare these leaves with this leaf. This is unlobed with smooth edges, and it is from uh, blue oak. Here are a bunch of blue oak leaves. And these leaves are from interior live oak. And, and the, this one is un, uh, doesn't have any spine tips. It has a smooth edge, but these do have a smooth edge. I mean, do have spine tips, and that's because of that browsing phenomenon that I mentioned. And uh, coast live oak and shrieve oak leaves are similarly unlobed except when browsed, and they're also a yellow or green. And also these leaves are glossier. These, the blue oaks have that matte finish, I meant, matte finish I mentioned, and these are a little bit shinier. And the, blue, and the uh, live oak leaves are stiffer also than the blue oak leaves. And last but not least, we have the blue oak acorn, which as you see, can be somewhat V-shaped like this and the here. Um, but these acorns aren't at all as long as valley oak acorns, and the cup doesn't come up as high on the nut. The cup is kind of hanging off, not always, but on, on so sometimes. And when it does, when it's, when it's uh, coming up higher, it just barely comes up as high as the cups do on valley oak acorns. So here we have two blue oak acorns and one valley oak acorn. And these were picked on the same day last fall. So you can see here the, the vast difference in size when they're all mature anyway. So we're gonna go out with a blue oak poem as, and read this with me, please. As summer goes on, blue's leaves become bluer with surfaces matte and lobes absent to fewer. Acorns don't measure much more than an inch. With small warty caps, the IDs a cinch. Okay, and so back to my earrings. <laughs> I wonder if you have any idea now what tree, what oak tree these acorns came from. And I'm going to show you a kind of not a very great photo of them. And the answer is these are valley oak acorns because they're so long and they, they taper so continuously. The caps aren't quite as deep as they could be, but these are young ones. So before we end, I want to let you know that you can find copies of my book on my website, as Sue said, and you can find the oak guides there. And I've just added a link on the home page so it's easier to find the oak guides. And there's also a link on the home page for a page of information and resources for restoring insect populations. And speaking of insects, on my home page, you'll also find a link for reading about and or purchasing the amazing, lightweight, life-changing, close focus binoculars that will enable to, you to see things like this longhorn fairy moth on a buttercup without even bending your knees. 
So I hope you aren't overwhelmed by the challenge of identifying oaks and can just think of it as fun. I recommend that you start with just one species, ideally an oak that has some pretty classic characteristics like this valley oak. Figure out the section first and then see if you can figure out the species. And I should have told you that if you really get into this, you are sure to come down with a serious case of Quercophilia. Some of the symptoms are obsessive interest in acorns. I have that really badly. Difficulty walking very far when you're in the presence of oaks and an abnormal preoccupation with sections. But seriously, please have faith that a time will come when you'll be walking along like the person in this photo. You'll be looking for flowers or animal tracks or tarantula burrows, who knows what. And you'll suddenly realize that you know what oak is you're walking under without even looking up or looking at its trunk or anything. And if you get to know your oaks, you will have endlessly interesting companions almost wherever you go. Well, not wherever you go, but in much of the Northern Hemisphere. And if you ever happen to be near UC Davis, I recommend going to the Arboretum especially in the fall. They have an inter there's an international oak grove there and you'll find some really different acorns with very different caps. And um, I also, you also can't, you have to go to visit the public restrooms. This is the wall of, one of the walls of the public restroom and Right near it, there is a circular bench covered with mosaic panels. I think they're circular mosaic panels in this circular bench that follow the development of an oak that germinated in the year 800 AD. And they follow it until its demise. I can't remember how long it lived. Maybe, yeah, I'm not sure how long it lived. Maybe to the... Um, 16 or 17 or 1800s. So finally, please consider joining and or supporting the California Native Plant Society and the California Oaks Coalition. Both are online and both are doing critically important conservation work. And for your information on April 1st, I will be giving a talk on California Oaks and all their relations or I'm not sure of the title yet, but it's going to be about oak ecology, the, the animals and plants that oaks associate with. And that's uh, for the Yerba Buena chapter of California Native Plant Society in San Francisco. So may the oaks be with you and may the oaks continue to be with us and all our relations. Thank you. And now it's time for questions. Okay. Hey, it's just so stunning. It's hard for me to talk after that because I'm just still absorbing all the information that you've given us. And yep. I, I um, can tell because there were so many thank yous at the end of the chat, thanking you specifically for the poems and the mnemonics and ways of remembering all the different information. Mm -hmm. So that is for you. Now I'm going to read you some of these questions and actually some of the questions were put in chat before you even began. Oh. <laughs> I'm just going to read them and then you can decide how we're going to roll from there. And Sue even got some yesterday and this morning. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. And here we go. All right. So uh, a lot of the questions were curious about galls. So the first question I caught was, which oak tree has the most complex relationship with galls? I'm well, not sure what complex means, so I'm passing that off to you. Yeah, I don't think it's a matter of complexity, but as far as I know, blue oak hosts more galls than any other oak. There are at least 41 uh, gall species known to lay their eggs on, on blue oaks. 
And then I see, I see uh, Valley Oak seems to be next. I see a lot of galls on Valley Oaks too. And could you just kind of briefly define what a gall is? Okay, yeah. A gall is a, uh, a, a nursery structure provided by a tree at the bidding of, in this case, an insect, a wasp. They're called cynipid wasps that, um, that order uh, oaks around. And so what happens is uh, a, a, a wasp lays an egg on an oak on, a, on growing tissue, whether it's leaf tissue or twig tissue or mid vein tissue in a leaf. And the, when a larva hatches out, the larva starts uh, chewing on the twig or leaf tissue. And as it's doing that, it secretes a hormone which mimics plant hormones and persuades the oak to produce a structure. Sometimes they're round and sometimes they look like sea urchins and sometimes they look like plates. And, um, and that, that structure contains a chamber or multiple chambers. And inside the chamber, uh, the walls are lined with food for the larva to eat. So I call it a, a, a multi, uh, a, a, a full service daycare center that the tree produces for the wasp larvae. So then the larvae pupate in there and a, a adult wasp chews her way out. Okay, wow. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so, so then it said, which oak hosts the most different types of gall? And you said blue. So I'm going to the next question here. Um, oracle oaks, can all deciduous oaks hybridize with live oaks? No. Um, they can only hybridize within their sections. So okay. deciduous white oaks can hybridize with live or evergreen white oaks. And the same is true for the red oaks. I don't even know much about uh, hybridization in the golden oaks. So an oracle oak is a hybrid of a California black oak and an interior live oak and or a shrieb oak. Okay. They're, they're, yeah. What would you think the lifespan is of a coast live oak? I don't know, but I would guess, I think I might have even read that they might live to be five or 600 years old. Okay. Um, no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's probably, I'm, I imagine it's at least 400, but I don't know how high it goes. When I first started studying this, I, I was, I read that valley oaks never lived to be longer than, older than 600 years, but there's one here in near Willits that's 800 years. They did a core sample and I've heard of, I think I've heard of thousand year old valley oaks too. Okay. So that kind of bl blends into this next question is, how do you, or someone just hiking and looking, how would you estimate an oak's age if you couldn't do a core sample? Oh, it's very, very difficult because a blue oak can be um, three feet tall and be a hundred years old. Okay. <laughs> so so it, it completely depends Ooh. on the conditions that they have grown in, you know, how many times they've burned or, of in, how much they've been browsed. It's, it's very hard for oaks to get above um, the heads of deer. And so that can, that'll slow down their, their growth rate a lot. So, you know, people, for different species, people often say, look for a particular trunk diameter at breast height. DBH means diameter at breast height. And that's how it's usually, determined uh, how the diameter, where that's how you determine the diameter, how you name the diameter of the tree. But um, I, I, it's hard to give you a rule of thumb. Okay. A laurel tree, um, should it not be planted near an oak tree due to the pathogen that it might cause sudden oak death? 
You heard that? Do you want to address it? So California Bay Laurel is the primary vector of sudden oak death. Okay. Which is a fungus-like organism. And um, the oaks that are susceptible to that are coast live oak, black oak, and uh, tan oaks, which aren't true oaks, of course. Um, yeah, Sue wants to say something. There are two more. Um, there's shreve oak, which actually oh, right. grows um, uh, up high in Sonola Regional Park and also, unfortunately, canyon live oak. Oh, right. So you'd only have to worry about it if it was one of those four species of oaks, of true oaks or coast or, or tan oak that okay. is suspect, suspect, susceptible to getting sudden oak death. And I don't know how to answer that question. You know, I, I hate to think of people cutting bay laurels down because they might give sudden oak death to the nearby oaks. But uh, so I don't know, what would you say to that, Sue? Um, I would direct people to a couple of websites. Um, one of them is suddenoakdeath.org, which is the website of the California Oak Mortality Task Force. There's tons of information there. And then also, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the lab, but it's Mateo Garbolato's lab, um, which has been, they've been studying sudden oak death for Gosh, how long is it now? 25 years. That's scary. Um, actually, 35 years. Uh, so, 25 years. Um, anyway, so if you if you just um, Google Matteo Garbolato, that's M-A-T-T-E-O-G-A-R-B-E-L-A-T-T-O, um, you will find his lab's website, and there's a ton of information there. Um, there is a kind of a distance phenomenon. Um, if the bay is within a certain distance, which changed a little bit recently, the, the data changed a little or the knowledge changed a little. So I don't really want to say what that is. It's some number of hundreds of yards. Um, if, it, if there's a bay within that distance of a coast live oak, then there is a po possibility that, that if that bay becomes um, infected, it will spread to the oak. The thing is that bays don't die from, from sudden oak death. They only have really minor um, leaf damage, really minor, but they are a major, major um, uh, intermediate yeah. host that, that then spreads the disease to the coast live oaks and the other three that are susceptible, and they can be killed outright. So it's a choice. Um, Thank you, Sue. Very helpful. Okay. Oh, and this is sort of like a trivia question. Um, where is the oldest oak in Oakland, California? I have no idea. Uh, if anyone has the answer, put it in the chat. <laughs> Um, oh, someone did say, could you remind, I think it just went quickly in your talk. You said, can you remind me what oaks have what color hair? Oh, the Kenyan live oaks, the leaves and the caps have a fine golden hair. Very, very fine velvety kind of hair like, uh, they're called hairs anyway. But okay, they're okay. Fine. okay. It looks I'm like glad kind of a golden fuzz. I'm glad you said they're called hairs anyway, because someone said, what are these hairs made of? Yeah, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it says, what is the coast live oak fuzz made of? Um, okay, it's can canyon live oak. Okay. Oh, oh, the, oh, the fuzz on the leaves, the hairy armpit. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a fine also kind of probably a sort of pre protective uh, fuzzy covering that normally covers the entire I mean, that originally, when a leaf is young, covers the entire underside of the leaf, but then it gets worn mm -hmm. off. So it's just the remnants that are left in those hairy armpits. Okay. Okay, here's a question. I have a large old live oak directly next to the fence with my neighbor. 
My neighbor is growing bamboo literally on top of the oak root system. The bamboo shoots are up in the canopy of the oak. Is the bamboo going to kill off the oak with time? Hmm. That's not my area of expertise. You should talk to a, a, a gardener or a, I, I'm not a gardener at all. This one is from, um, from Alan. Um, are there any easier ways to identify scrub oak? In my county, Alameda, Cal Flora shows Quercus berberitifolia in a couple of parks like Garen and Hayward and in Livermore. So I need to go there and see for myself. Any sightings in Oakland, Berkeley, or Contra Costa County would be great. Thanks in advance. And I think this is a good a good question if anybody in the audience has an answer. Who's, but um, I'll pose it to you, Kate, but you don't. I have an counties. answer. I don't, I don't know about uh, where they are, but I know that uh, a really good way to identify them. People often confuse them with interior live oak. And what you should look for is a gall called the beaked twig gall, which is uh, when it's fresh and young, it's kind of, uh, it's red with yellow spots and it comes to kind of a, a beak shape, a, a point. And um, you should go online to Joyce Gross's, JoyceGrossPhotography.com site and look at a picture of a beaked twig gall. And you can often find the remnants of them, which aren't as colorful, they're just kind of brownish. But once you know what you're looking for, that is a good way to identify a California scrub oak, berberitifolia. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question here um, from Lyndon. It says, if you want to scatter acorns or encourage oaks to take hold on a hillside, what should you do? Do you need to somehow protect saplings from deer so that they have a chance? Yes, so what you should do is um, when it looks like rain is imminent or when it, rain will be reliable, you put acorns in the ground under about you know, an inch of soil or so. And then you should put a cage around them. You could start with just a cage of you know, maybe a one foot diameter because you might want to wait and see how the acorn, whether it germinates or not. And then you do have to protect it. And you can also put a, a rodent cage. Uh, so the outer circle can be uh, like chicken wire with a one inch diameter or so that will keep out deer. But a one inch diameter won't keep out rodents. So for that, for them, you need about a half inch diameter of hardware cloth or chicken wire. And um, you can make a, and you have to put a bottom on it. So before you plant the acorn, you um, hollow out, I forget how far down you have to go dig. And then you put a cylinder with a bottom on it. That's about a, a half inch diameter of uh, chicken wire or hardware cloth to keep rodents out. Oh, then, underneath, underneath where you're putting the acorn. Yeah, and then you fill some dirt in and you put the acorn in above, above the bottom of the cage. And then you surround that cage with another cage. And that, that one only has to be, you know, six or eight inches high to keep the rodents out. But you, then the other cage has to be about four feet high to keep the deer out. Isn't it amazing they actually grow in nature when I listen to the contraption <laughs> you're talking about constructing to protect one acorn? Yeah. So is there a better way to set the acorn in the ground? Does it need to go like point down, cap down, sideways? You can put it on its side. Okay. And another really good thing to do is go out looking for, a, for oak uh, seedlings that have germinated on their own and Ooh. protect them. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sue, so do you have one or you want me to ask one more? Okay, I'm gonna ask another one. So this is an etiquette question. What is the best, most sustainable etiquette for collecting acorns? 
You mean, should you trespass on other people's land? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, or should you leave them there? And, it, you know, you see some of the things that say, like, take pictures, don't take the actual flower, don't take the actual acorn. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't like to see, uh, well, you know, the native Californians used to collect a thousand pounds of acorn, eat a thousand pounds of acorn a year and and put another thousand by. Oaks produce enormous numbers of acorns, way more than are needed. They produce them for the for the birds and the squirrels. And so, you know, if you take some, I don't think it's going to be a problem. And then once you take them, what is your personal favorite acorn recipe? People want to know, it's a real question. I don't have one. Well, I made <laughs> acorn uh, chocolate bars once. Those were really good. <laughs> <laughs> acorn meal, acorn bread with chocolate chips. <laughs> oh, okay. I think it might've been the chocolate part that was the really good part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I haven't, I haven't made much acorn. I haven't yeah. made very much myself. I was um, at a friend's who, who makes bread regularly and he made acorn bread and I definitely could taste the, the flour of it. It had like that little bit of a bitterness to it, but I was excited to try it. Stevie, um, you're, you're on. Hey, quick question. Thank you, Kate. Um, just my question was, um, you had talked about the galls and I missed one detail. Did the pupae in the gall, did it eat its siblings or did, did, I missed something about that, that I think I heard you say only one emerged. Could you clarify that for me? Oh. Well, so some galls are condominiums, like the oak apple galls have a whole bunch of chambers in them, but um, most chambers contain only one larva and that larva then um, pupates, which means it, you know, goes into a uh, sort of a container, a case where it completely dissolves and then reforms as an adult wasp. And that adult wasp then chews her way out of the gall. And that, so when you see little tiny holes in galls that are about oh, a millimeter or two across. Those are the exit holes from made by the adult wasp chewing her way out. And those big oak apple galls, you'll see a whole bunch of exit holes because they're condominiums. And is that on the white oak? Those are, so that's the, the case with any uh, gall on any oak that, not the condos, but that process occurs on any oak. any oak, because most of the, all the oaks have galls of one sort or another, but the white oaks have the most galls and they have those really colorful. Um, Thank you. Oddly shaped galls, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, now Elaine, it is your turn now for real, so. Okay, I'm gonna leave the video off because my I'm in my studio and it's a bit of a mess. Um, I have a large Quercus agrifola in my backyard um, at chest height. I can't. I can just have my fingers can barely touch around the diameter. Mm. It's got. Um, it looks like it's got some kind of beetles and, and two cracks toward the base of it, and it, it's lost. It's got a very thin crown. I mean, it just looks to me like it's really stressed out. And I'm wondering if it's normal for a uh, Quercus agrifolia to have a thin crown, if um, bark beetles are fatal, and also I'm wondering about what kind of resources I can call on to deal with this tree. Um, I call two different arborists on occasion and they're just kind of dismissive about what's going on with the tree. And I think they're more interested in just selling, you know, a pruning service and some mow blow and go than giving me information on, on how to help this tree thrive. So it's a compound question. I apologize for that, but I've been looking for ages. Um, are, are these bark beetles lethal? Is a thin crown a sign of distress with this particular species? And also what sort of really authoritative people can I contact to suss out this tree and see what I can do to make it thrive? 
Well, I don't know anything Ooh. about um, bark beetles uh, on Coast Live Oak. I know that a thin crown can definitely be a sign of stress and um, you might try going to Lee Klinger's site, which is called Sudden Oak Life. Uh, he has taken some oaks, I, I think they were all coast live oaks with, that had very, very thin looking crowns. And over a period of three years, he did fire mimicry work with them, uh, which is basically a way of remineralizing the soil and um, I think dusting the bark. And I, I've seen pictures of them and the trees look much healthier and they're very clearly true before and after pictures. And I'd like to see what Sue has to say about this. Um, I would say, yeah, I'm not familiar with Lee Klinger's work. So I, I am aware of that he's, you know, what he's doing. So I really don't know about his work, but um, what county are you in, Aline? Alameda. Okay, um, try contacting First, the uh, UC Cooperative Extension in Alameda County. Um, there's uh, usually some kind of an agricultural, I don't know what they're called now, but there's an advisor who may be able to help. And also the Alameda County Master Gardeners. Most Master Gardener um, groups have uh, some kind of a helpline. Uh, they used to have in-person yeah, I, I am a master gardener. And, oh, you uh, are? <laughs> yeah, a lot of the questions we get are, are my tomatoes. <laughs> okay, and got I'm, it. Yeah, I try the um, the cooperative extension office if you haven't already. Have you done that already? Uh, no, I haven't tried the cooperative extension, but I'll tell you the master gardeners are about gardening. They're not necessarily about, um, you know, th there aren't a lot of arborist type resources, although some of them are very good at fruit trees. Okay. So, yeah, I think it depends on the county too. Different yeah. counties have different emphases, but okay. Yeah, um, beyond that, again, check on um, the suddenoakdeath.org website. You might find some resources there just for, um, you know, uh, people who are available or organizations that are, that are um, provide information like what you're seeking. Thanks. Okay, so next is William, who's been waiting patiently. So you can unmute yourself. Uh, my question is about oak galls. Are they harmful to the tree? Well, uh, they don't seem to be when they occur in fairly small numbers. And actually, I've seen photos of trees, oak trees, that were so covered with galls that they looked like they were, were flowering with pink flowers from a distance. Just com they looked completely pink. And, uh, but as far as I know, even those trees uh, the next year looked normal. I, I'd have to check with Joyce Gross about that because she's the person who sent me the photos. Um, but Nobody really knows for sure. Um, there's one idea. I don't know if this is originally my idea. A, a lot of oaks, I mean, a lot of galls are high in tannins. And so it's possible that they could be, they could help the tree by being a reservoir where the tree can dump excess tannins. But that's the only beneficial benefit that I have ever heard even stated as a possibility for for the um, benefit of galls to gall wasps and galls to oaks. It seems like they must tax the tree somewhat. I, oh yeah, because often you'll see valley oaks, thin spindly valley oaks that are covered with galls and they don't look very healthy. So when there's an excess of them, I think it definitely, I think it definitely, I'm pretty sure it would tax the tree. Thank you. Michaela. Um, Feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much for all this information. It's so amazing and thank you for organizing. Um, I was wondering how did the oaks first um, dis like disperse across the world? Like how did they end up 
in North America and in China, like all those million years ago. Well, I think they originated in North America, but I, I'm afraid I can't tell you much about their dispersal. That's not something I know much about. No Good worries. question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and um, every, uh, let's see, uh, Lori is next. Oh, hi. Um, I was curious because because I was uh, with doing some work for the California Plant Society at Lake Cunningham, and I'm pretty new to plants to begin with. But there's a problem with the little the the seedlings that we're planting getting eaten by the rodents, and um, and I, I'm trying to get in my mind's eye about the oaks. Do you have the the bigger cage that's a foot in a diameter for the deer and then there's the smaller cage for the rodents so is that right and you put um some sort of uh I, I can't find the name of some sort of landscaping fabric or something underneath where you plant the acorn to keep well, just, the road so just for th so think of uh, a cylinder made out of half inch chicken wire where you know the openings are half an inch or or less, okay. or hardware cloth. And so think of um, rolling that into a cylinder and fastening mm -hmm. it with wire, and, yeah. then, and then just cutting a circle of the same material and wiring it to the bottom. Or just kind of, you could stuff it down from the top and just kind of wedge it in too, I, I think. And, um, and then you, you dig down, and I can't remember if it's four inches, maybe about, dig down maybe about four inches, and then backfill, then put, set that cylinder in the hole you've created, a cylindrical hole, and then backfill with dirt, and then put your acorn in like an inch under the surface or something like that. Oh, so the, the roots will just go on top and spread out it, on top of the no, they'll go, they'll go down and they'll go through your hardware cloth or your- Oh, thank you, gotcha. I got it. Thank you so much. Okay. I have a mystery oak on my property in Southern Sonoma County. It looks kind of like a blue oak. Any tips on how I can determine if it is truly a blue oak versus a hybrid? This is from somebody named Sue. Mm. Well, uh, on my oak guide, I have a couple of galls that are found only on blue oaks, um, but there's a very good chance it's a hybrid <laughs> because there is so much hybridization among oaks. So when it's a hybrid, and let's say, let's say it's a hybrid, but you find on it the, uh, I think it's called coralline gall that's found only on blue oaks, then you would just decide that, well, this is mostly blue oak or it's more blue oak than anything else. Um, you can also look at the color of the leaves. Uh, if, if the leaves have a distinct bluish cast, then, then it's probably a blue oak, but sometimes blue oak leaves have kind of a yellow green cast too, and it's not only early in the growing season. So um, the acorn is a really good, is a really good way, um, but, the acorns also show signs of hybridization. They can be a little bigger and be more like a valley oak acorn or be a little bit round and be like an Oregon oak acorn. So it's really hard to tell without seeing it. And even then, as I said, if I saw it, I might just say, heck if I know. <laughs> here's a, here's a, a quick and easy question. What is the date of your April talk? April 1st. <laughs> and people can find the information on your website? 7.30 p.m. Uh, oh yeah, I didn't mention, uh, if you would like to receive notification of my, of my talks, and hopefully someday again walks, or, and, or, and receive uh, occasional photo essays that I send out, go to my website and go to the contact page, and it'll tell you what to do there. The, that's how you can sign up to be on my email list. 
And yes, I always send out notices to everybody that's on my email list about any talk I'm giving. And, or, um, yeah, that's, that's the best way to do it. It'll be at 7.30 in the afternoon, and you'll also be able to go to the California Native Plant Society Yerba Buena chapter to find out, to, to see an announcement of it there. Um, it's not there yet, though. We just decided this two days ago, so. Um, there's another raised hand, um, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Um, and you'll need to unmute yourself, Barbara. I put the video on, but I didn't unmute. Yeah, um, when fire season comes along, we're told to limb our trees up at least 10 feet above the ground. And I did that with some of them last summer, and they kind of just cut them off right halfway up the limb. I have another one. This is probably more of a tree care um, question. And if you don't know, maybe somebody out there knows. I have another huge tree. It's a, it's a live oak. I mean, it's a um, evergreen oak of some kind. And the leaves, the branches come all the way down to the ground. The leaves are touching the ground. And I'm wondering if I cut them off at the base, it's gonna take half the tree away. This is a very old tree. Or if it's you know safe to just hack them off halfway up the branch. So, you know, if anybody out there knows the answer to that question, I'd like to know. Because I don't want to damage that tree. It's gorgeous and it's ancient. But I, I also um, want to be fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, as you told me, limbing up and cutting branches off halfway, I was squirming in my chair. Um, I, you know, um, counties and municipalities and whatever have rules that are applied broadly and they don't always fit individual situations, especially when you like what you're describing. Um, so um, I, I would suggest that you talk to whoever it is that's, um, is it a requirement that you do that, that you limb up the trees? Well, I'm in the country, in the hills, and they uh, str they strongly advise that we do everything we can to be fire safe, or they're not going to save our house if if it's a question of us and another house is fire safe. So, is your is your um, tree right next to your house? No, it's about I think it's about 50, 75 feet away. Oh, well, that's oh. pretty far away. Yeah, I don't think you need to do anything. No. Yeah. Oh. Um, Okay. You, one thing to know is that um, coast live oaks um, don't take too well to massive pruning all at once. Um, so you very well could do some serious harm to a tree by pruning it the way you were describing. So, Well, I didn't do it. They did oh, it. <laughs> I, I know. So I know. I'm, I'm not saying you. Did it. I mean... <laughs> And yeah. somebody could do. Another angle yeah. on this is that houses usually burn more from flying embers than from the foliage nearby igniting. And so if you harden your house against ignition by embers, then you can preserve a lot of the, the natural native vegetation around it. Here's I, don't know, yeah. I don't know if, uh, you know, if, well, yeah. that far away, I don't think a fire department would say, oh, this this house is a goner. I think they would, I don't think that would be a, a it's not much of a risk. Um, another Good. thing, um, yeah. Matteo Garbolato, who has, you yeah. know, with his labs and, and many colleagues studied sudden oak death for many years, has now um, turned some of his attention and his lab's attention to wildfire and um, I actually I'm going to try to um, I'm going to invite him to speak to our chapter. He I, I saw a two-hour presentation he gave um, on um, on wildfire safety, <clears throat> especially in areas like yours, and he's also working on 
um, helping people learn how to harden their homes. So in the future, I'm not quite sure when, you know, when they'll be ready to be giving more presentations, but there will be presentations out there and, and you can check, um, I'll include yet another link in the ones I'm sending to that portion Ooh. of his website. Thank you. Good, thank you. So um, I, I was just curious, um, I'm very interested, well, I, I love watching wildlife and, and um, and you mentioned that you had these really fantastic binoculars that you recommend, Kate did. And uh, I was just wondering if you had other suggestions also to um, do wildlife photography, um, you know, uh, so I guess we can share some of the fantastic nature that we get to see. Well, I'm not much of a photographer. I happen to have recently acquired a Panasonic F Lumix FZ300 that I'm taking better pictures with than I ever did before, but I still don't really understand it because it has so many bells and whistles. So I can't, I'm afraid I can't help you with that. I don't know if there are any photographers still participating, um, but I think that's more of a, a question for a photography club. Okay, all right, thank you. Just thought, you know. <laughs> yeah might have come across. Oh, and, then, and then camera traps, you might consider camera traps also. They can give you really great information about what's a, what, who's coming through where, which animals are using which trails and. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, um, so Michael is next. Hey, uh, thanks for that great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could recommend any books about oaks um, some that are somewhat like in the spirit of the book that you wrote. I, um, that I, I, um, I like the sort of combination of data and like what, what you described as like oak lore. I'm, I'm wondering if you could recommend anything. Well, there's a book called The Oaks of California that came out in the 90s. And there is a brand new book that I'm not quite sure of the title of, but maybe someone knows. It's by Doug Tallamy. And the title is something like Why We Need Oaks or Why Oaks Are So Important or something like that. And he's the, he's the uh, scientist on the East Coast who has pretty much brought to our attention the importance of caterpillars uh, to, for birds and native plants, the importance of native plants for caterpillars and native landscaping in general for insects. And uh, across the United States, oaks support more caterpillars, more moth and butterfly larvae than any other kind of tree. 80, I've, I forget what the number is. Um, so, so so, but I haven't read his book yet, so I don't know. And then there's a book by Glenn Keeter called The Life of an Oak, but it's not so much about wildlife relationships. Um, what do you, anybody else have any, Sue, do you have any? Um, you know, I was gonna mention a couple of the ones you did. Are you planning on field trips or walks through oak woodlands in the fall if the pandemic is controlled? And how many people go on walks? I think the cost is on your website. That's a question. Oh, well, what my website has on it is post COVID, I had the idea that I could um, lead walks of maybe five people plus me. And so I, uh, and my idea is that uh, people, landowners or people that you would organize it and I would just show up and um, for a four or five hour walk, uh, I was gonna charge $350. Nobody has taken me up on that yet. So I don't know uh, if it's because of COVID or if it's because it's too much money or what, but so that's, that's all I'm doing walk wise now for the public. I go on walks with my friends and just for fun. 
you could even, if you wanted to contact me and travel up here for a walk for a few people, I, that, that would work too. I want to thank you so much, Kate. That's a really wonderful way to learn how to identify oaks. And the fact that you can communicate that to people via Zoom is really incredible. There are a lot of comments here that, uh, from people who are just excited to get out and apply their new skills out in the world. So um, this is really great. Yeah. Great.